if God had submitted the manuscript of the Torah to a writer's workshop of any kind, the notes on Genesis in particular would probably have centered on the need for a little bit more character development before they rush out into the main action of the story. All we know about Noah, as we talked about last week, was that he was ish tzaddik tamim b'dorotav, a good guy in his generation, and that qualified him as sole survivor of the flood. If it's possible, we know even less about Avraham. Abraham's first 75 years are a mystery to us. We get his genealogy, and then at age 75, this man hears a voice out of heaven that says, leave behind everything you've ever known and go on a journey to a place that I will show you and be a blessing. And for the next 3,000 years, our Jewish story has been extended footnotes on his decision to say yes. But we know next to nothing about Abraham's character before the time that he receives his call. And so for the last 20 centuries, the rabbis have sought to fill in that tremendous gap in our tradition by weaving stories, midrashim, about Abraham's origin. Who was this man and what led him to be both someone who God would tap on the shoulder and maybe even more importantly, someone who would say yes. One of the most famous midrashim of why Abraham is so well known that actually many students I've encountered have thought it's in the Torah itself. It's the story of Abraham as a young man working in his father's idol shop. This is a story that many people have heard, but rarely actually seen or studied the text of. I want to share with you one version of that story from a collection of Midrashim called Tana de Be'eliyahu. This is not the first time the story is told, but it's one of the most complete versions that we have. Abraham's family used to make and sell idols in the marketplace. One day, Abraham's turn came to sell, and his father gave him a basket of household gods and told, them, told him to go set it up in the shuk. A man came and asked, have you a God to sell? And Abraham replied, what kind of God are you looking for? The man said, I'm a mighty man. Give me a God as mighty as myself. And so Abraham took an image that was on the highest shelf and said, take this one. The one who sits on the highest shelf must clearly be the mightiest. The man was pleased with that answer. And as he was about to leave, Abraham said, how old are you? And the man said, 70 years. And Abraham said, woe to a man of 70 who bows to something that we just made today. You made it to 70 years and you don't know that I put it on the highest shelf. Next story. A woman came carrying a bowl of fine flour and said, here, offer it to one of the gods. At that, Abraham seized a stick and smashed all of the statues and placed the stick in the hands of the biggest one. You've heard this one before. When his father came, he said, who did this to all of my gods? And Abraham answered, would I hide anything from my father? A woman came with a bowl of flour and said, here, offer it to them. And when I offered it, one God said, I will eat it first. And another God said, I will eat it first. And the biggest of them rose up and smashed the others. And his father replied, are you mocking me? They can't do anything. And Abraham said, you said they cannot. Let your ears hear what your mouth is saying. Sassy teenager, right? <laughs> and in fact, that's one of the reasons that I wanted to bring this text today, because 
The Midrash also says that Abraham was 13 years old at the time he was put in charge of his father's idol shop. And that one of the sources for why B'nai Mitzvah takes place at 13 is, in fact, that this is recognized to be the age of rebellion. The age of rebellion, the moment in a person's life cycle when their job is to look at the wisdom that they have received and to evaluate it critically. And that is temporary pain and long-term gain. It's not so easy for the kid I'm talking about, not the parents. It's not so easy to look at everything you have been taught your whole life, the world that has been created for you, and to ask questions. It would be simpler, as Aaron told us, to have the same thing for breakfast every morning, to believe the same ideas that you believed before. But in fact, it is necessary work. It is painful work, but it is necessary work to deeply evaluate received traditions, and to decide for ourselves what resonates with us. It's also a pain in the tuchus to be a parent of a teenager, I'm sure. I am the parent of a three-year-old who is discovering in her own way that she has the capacity for will, that if I say, come here, she doesn't actually have to do it. Now, I can still pick her up, but she's learning that her legs work under her own power. And I got to tell you, it was simpler when she didn't know that. (laughs) But the truth is, is I certainly wouldn't want it any other way for my three-year-old. And for many of you, probably most of you who have raised teenagers, if you are truly honest, you wouldn't want it any other way either. Because you did it with your own parents, and they did it with theirs, and they did it before that. We have to become our own people. That's what we're put in the world to be. And so Abraham the rebel, Abraham with some sass, Abraham with a good Jewish sense of humor, concealing something profound with a little bit of an edge, is doing that vital task that we call growing up. And we model our B'nai Mitzvah ceremony, our 13-year-old ceremony, on the very first Jew, who did that very necessary thing. The second reason I bring you this text is because I think it tells us something countercultural about what religion is meant to be in the world. Religion's greatest critics and religion's most ferocious advocates both agree on something, that religion is meant to make people docile, to make them obedient, to make them follow the rules. That's the criticism against religion, right? That it's the opiate of the masses that turns us into sheep. That's the line that religious fanatics have taken. It says so in the book, don't ask further questions. God said it, I believe it, end of story. In that way, the two ends of the spectrum kiss and reinforce one another. And we, we who study Torah with an eye of love and respect, but also by virtue, I believe, of being in this room, don't sit on either of those fanatical ends. We are neither fanatically anti-religion or we would have done something else with our morning, nor fanatics for a particular interpretation, or we wouldn't be able to share in this ceremony which blends together the traditional and the modern so beautifully and so seamlessly. We in this room have a profoundly important message to give those in the world who see religion either as a danger or religion as a means of shutting down and closing conversations. We have a vital message to give which is that our religion was born in iconoclasm. Our religion was born in the smashing of idols, in the evaluation of received tradition, and the voice of conscience, which overcomes the voice of the way it's always been done, that has looked at the idols of history 
and has seen in those idols of history that, them for what they are, which is representations, not the thing itself. And so in an era in which we both hear the rise of an anti-religious philosophy, which says that we are fools for gathering in this room, that we are lulling ourselves to sleep, and in an era with a rise of authoritarian religion, which demands a certain kind of mindless and blind obedience, we respond back that religion's power in the world is to be disruptive. Religion's power in the world is to invite us to questions. Religion's power in the world is to demand that we smash idols. Religion's power in the world is to be the children of Abraham who first looked at the idols and said, why, and didn't walk away from spirit, but walked towards it. To be the descendants of Jacob who wrestled and didn't walk away from the wrestling match, but continued it on and bequeathed it to the rest of us. We are the children of idol smashers. We are the children of wrestlers. We are the bearers of sacred tradition, and God forbid we forget it. And so this midrash, a window into a particular moment of our lives when at 13 we are asked to question that which we've received, is also a window into our task from that point forward, which is to not stop asking why, to not stop wrestling for truth, to not stop smashing idols, and to stand up to those who say that religion's job is to make us quiet, and instead to say back to them, no, religion's job is to make us awake. And that job has never been more important. Shabbat Shalom.